I'm joined once again by a professor of international law, Dr. Alfred Desayas. He is a retired senior lawyer from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and former secretary of the Human Rights Committee. He was the first UN appointed special reporter and independent expert on human rights. He's joining us from Switzerland to talk about a range of pressing issues, which includes the glowing, uh, growing global humanitarian crisis we're experiencing catalyzed by COVID-19. Before we begin the interview, let me just remind listeners that our recent interview with law professor Dr. Francis Boyle was just terminated by YouTube. It had over 300,000 views. It's still available on all of our audio podca podcast channels, such as SoundCloud, Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and so on, as well as our alternative video channels, such as BitChute. So it's imperative that you subscribe to our email list and our alternative channels uh, if you want to continue receiving this groundbreaking analysis and information. And you can find that all on geopoliticsandempire.com. So, all right, well, Dr. Desaias, it's good to see you're doing well, and thanks for coming back on Geopolitics and Empire. Very well. Thanks for inviting me again. And uh, since you just mentioned uh, the uh, censorship by uh, YouTube, this is an issue of uh, growing importance, and I think that uh, you should uh, flag this to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights as a violation of Article 19 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is not just freedom of expression, is access to information. Article 19 guarantees the right uh, to seek and impart information. And to the extent that uh, YouTube is interfering with that right, to the extent uh, that uh, YouTube is uh, exercising undemocratically a form of uh, censorship, that has to be condemned. Uh, my colleague, uh, the uh, special rapporteur on freedom of expression, uh, Professor David Kay from UCLA, uh, I would suggest uh, you write him too. Uh, you can find his email in the website of the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, www.ohchr.org, and then you go on thematic mandates and the mandate of the special rapporteur on uh, freedom of expression. Uh, beyond that, uh, talking about um, COVID-19. Uh, now, this is, in a way, uh, the hour of multilateralism. I mean, the idea that you can solve COVID-19 unilaterally is laughable. And uh, if this were an extraterrestrial attack on planet Earth, if this was uh, an alien attack, uh, obviously humanity uh, would join forces to fight it. And this is the hour to join forces. And uh, obviously immediate uh, help is needed. There are some countries that need more help than others. Some countries that have been, shall we say, touched uh, severely like Italy, like uh, Spain, etc. China is helping uh, with uh, masks and with all sorts of other medical uh, equipment, uh, but uh, it's going uh, to get uh, worse before it gets better. Now, one of my concerns with um, COVID and the way we are handling it is uh, that the uh, healthcare of many, many countries has been adversely affected by the neoliberal approach uh, to um, uh, budgets and uh, economics. Countries uh, have been uh, forced to adopt so-called austerity measures and the austerity measures uh, has been uh, applied in the field of uh, infrastructure, in the field of uh, uh, research and development in matters of uh, health and pandemics, et cetera, et cetera, in healthcare. Now, already in my report to the General Assembly back in 2017 about the uh, International Monetary Fund, and uh, their loan conditionalities. I condemned the no loan conditionalities because they led to a uh, uh, diminution 
of the state investment in uh, social matters, in particular in uh, uh, healthcare. What happened in particular in um, the Western African states, Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire, etc., when the Ebola uh, epidemic hit, is that they were thoroughly unprepared because they had to pay back loans to the IMF. And uh, instead of reducing their expenditures in other fields, they reduced it in the field of uh, medicine. Result, as you could read in the uh, professional uh, studies uh, and analysis uh, of the Lancet, uh, is that uh, they were thoroughly unprepared uh, to deal with Ebola, so that uh, the IMF bears responsibility uh, for uh, this uh, disaster. Uh, now we have a disaster with COVID-19. Uh, uh, how many countries would be fighting it more efficiently if they had put more money into research and development into pandemics and how to deal with pandemics if they had uh, all the necessary equipment in hospitals, including just simple as number of beds. I mean, it's, it, it's amazing how I'm a member here of the uh, Club Alpin Suisse of the uh, Alpine uh, Club. I mean, we've been told, obviously, uh, not to go to the mountains, not to risk ourselves, uh, because if I, we break a leg when we go uh, hiking, we're going to use a bed. You need those beds for people who have other problems like uh, contamination with COVID. But um, quite generally, I find that uh, the uh, budgets of the United States, uh, of most European countries, most NATO countries, for instance, uh, it's obscene, the amount of uh, money that is devoted uh, to war, that is devoted to war mongering, that is devoted uh, to the military, industrial, financial complex. These are the only people who are profiteering from the uh, situation. Uh, a trillion dollars in the United States goes into matters directly or indirectly uh, related uh, to uh, war directed uh, to the Pentagon or to nuclear um, energy and nuclear tests and all sorts of things. Now, uh, if that money uh, had been put into hospitals, we wouldn't have people dying as we do in the United States. And I'm not saying only because of pandemics, I'm saying just quite routinely. People die unnecessarily because we don't have a functioning healthcare system in the United States. So the priorities are all wrong. And I think it is imperative uh, that uh, all countries in the uh, European Union and all countries members of NATO stop uh, their aggressive wars, uh, whether it be in uh, uh, Libya or in Syria, where they all have their hands full of blood, uh, and uh, they concentrate on the responsibility to protect their own citizens. I mean, we talk a lot about R2P. Well, R2P is not going and getting involved somewhere at 10,000 kilometers uh, from your home and meddling in the affairs of another country. R2P means protecting your own population from pandemics, protecting your own population from the scourge of war. And as I said, those priorities uh, must be uh, recognized. Now, going back to concrete um, uh, measures, you know that Iran has uh, released a uh, considerable number of uh, detainees in connection with uh, coronavirus. Uh, I think the state of Ohio in the United States is releasing prisoners in connection with uh, the pandemic. Now, uh, there are many other uh, persons who are detained, and especially those who are detained unjustly, those who are uh, victims of arbitrary detention, like Julian Assange uh, in the United Kingdom. These people should be released. Uh, in um, Turkey, 
there are something like 50,000 persons uh, in pretrial detention in connection with the so-called coup attempt of July 2016. That's four years ago. And uh, how about releasing these people and sending them back to their families? I mean, uh, these are, uh, shall we say, urgent matters that should be discussed uh, in uh, the mainstream media, but they are left out. I mean, it's not so much that the uh, mainstream media engages in fake news. They do, they do, but is that the mainstream media suppresses information. The mainstream media gives you 20% of the information, thereby making it absolutely necessary for a person who wants to be well informed to every day, as I do. Not only do I read BBC or CNN and New York Times, but I also consult CCTV, the Chinese. I consult RT, the Russians. I consult, consult uh, Telesur, uh, the Latin Americans. I consult Al Jazeera. And I consult, of course, the other alternative media like the Real News Network, um, A.B. Martin uh, and the Empire Files and A Amy Goodman uh, and Democracy Now, etc., etc. So, so what, you, what are, you, you yourself are doing uh, something important. I mean, you are getting some information out that otherwise is not out. You interviewed uh, Francis Boyle. Most people do not know that Professor Francis Boyle has not one, but two doctorates from Harvard University. He is not just any other professor. He is a particularly uh, brilliant man, but of course, he says things that are politically incorrect. He says things that the elites do not want people to know, and that's why he is being blocked. That's why he's being mobbed. That's why he's being threatened. Me, too. I mean, I get all sorts of insults in my uh, uh, email. I get uh, uh, insults in uh, my Twitter and in my Facebook. And when I went to Venezuela back in 2017, in November, December, 17, there was a huge uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, campaign against me in which I was threatened. Uh, so these are things that have to be uh, kept in mind. It's very important to have courageous uh, journalists who at least make an effort to get uh, the information out to the citizens. So I, I, on that note, on that note uh, 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 this censorship, censorship is going on. Going You've on. been You've tweeting been about tweeting certain about issues such as Yanis uh, 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 Varoufakis, who released these Euro leaks, um, which show the undemocratic nature of uh, of the EU. Uh, you're talking about uh, Julian Assange. Um, I think today they just released uh, Chelsea Manning, and so and and now we're in in light of the context of COVID-19. What's happening to my channel is happening to a lot of people now on all of the social media. So there's in the West now, like in the EU, Euroleaks, uh, in the US, they're censoring. And, and, you know, I kind of see Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, what's happening to his case, uh, case is kind of like the test case that will tell Indeed. us the, yeah. the future of democracy in the West. So can you speak to this, what's happening, this kind of tendency where we're moving a bit more in the West away from democracy? Well, when you're saying democracy, you mean actually ruled by the people. When you're using the word, uh, you mean it. You mean uh, government by the people for the people. But uh, when they use the term democracy, they mean ruled by the elites, ruled by the oligarchies. And if you step out of line, uh, you will be ostracized. Uh, you will be made to suffer economically. Uh, your career will be destroyed, you will be defamed. Uh, you know the old Roman saying, calumniare audacter, semper aliquid heret. Go ahead and defame uh, your opponent because always something is going to stick. 
people are going to remember something negative about the person. This is a, a cloud that comes over you. So uh, what we're witnessing is the hijacking of the system. Uh, people talk about the rule of law, but they don't mean the rule of justice. Uh, they mean positivism. They mean the laws that the elites have adopted to maintain their power. Those are the laws that have to be maintained. But even if you talk about the rule of law, the rule of law can only function if you have stability of language. If you have what the Germans called Rechtssicherheit, that language means something. Uh, but uh, more and more, we're living in uh, a 1984 world in which there is a newspeak and words don't mean what uh, they were supposed to mean. And uh, so in many so-called democratic uh, governments, uh, you have a hijacking of the institutions themselves. I have uh, grave, grave worries about Germany uh, with uh, the new head of the so-called Verfassungsschutz, the so-called uh, uh, protector of the Constitution. In my view, he is exactly the person who is there to destroy the Constitution, to hollow it out. Uh, he's been put there for that purpose. Uh, and his predecessor, who was defending the Constitution, was dismissed, uh, uh, Dr. Maasen. Uh, and uh, this is quite problematic because you have generally in all Western democratic uh, countries, whether it be uh, the United Kingdom, whether it be France, whether it be uh, uh, Germany, whether it be Spain, uh, you're having a hijacking. Uh, of the system and a weaponization of language, an instrumentalization of language uh, in order to destroy uh, human dignity, human rights, etc., in order to control. Uh, I've written about the weaponization of human rights, and that's something that worries me very much because it's also practiced by my former office by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So they engage in what is called naming and shaming, but then selectively, only against this country or that country, but then others are protected. So there is systematic double standards. And uh, that again is a great disappointment. I was hired into the United Nations by someone whom I still admire a great deal, um, uh, Professor Theo van Boven, a Dutchman, and his successor was a uh, great uh, Austrian jurist, um, uh, Dr. Kurt Herndl, and his successor was a um, uh, Swedish uh, diplomat, uh, Jan Martinson, etc., etc. But uh, for some time now, uh, human rights uh, and the human rights program uh, has been hijacked by lobbies. And part of the problem is that uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and uh, also non-governmental organizations like um, Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or the International Service for Human Rights. What do you think they do? Who sets their agenda? Uh, are they independent? Are they objective? Uh, the big corporations, the donors that finance them, tell them what to do and what not to do. Because sometimes you say, why isn't the office taking position against, for instance, uh, the sanctions regime that the United States has imposed on Iran, has imposed on Syria, has imposed on Venezuela, has imposed on Cuba. And this is beginning worse, not better. Uh, well, I suppose uh, the office is concerned about its funding. And since uh, who's imposing the sanctions? The United States, Canada, Australia, the European Union, etc. 
those are the major donors, so they don't want to tell their donors you are violating human rights. Now, an interesting development, uh, actually it has a long history because uh, it's quite clear to you and to me and to anyone with a little bit of common sense that if you impose a financial blockade on a country, if you impose uh, really comprehensive sanctions as there are against Iran and against uh, Venezuela and against Cuba, that's going to have a human rights impact. I mean, that's automatic. And uh, when that human rights impact means that you have no access to medicines, you have no access to dialysis equipment, because the problem is with, say, scan machines or with any, any number of very complex uh, medical equipment, uh, it needs replacement parts. If you don't have replacement parts because the United States do, does not let you buy them, it's not only that you cannot buy them from the United States, you cannot buy them from another country because then the entrepreneur who's going to send it to you, uh, sell it to you is going to be sanctioned by the Department of the Treasury. And the sanctions, by the way, are huge. The penalties can be $200,000, $500,000, etc., etc., if you have any dealings with Iran or any dealings uh, with Cuba. So what happens is that uh, pharmaceuticals, um, pharmaceutical companies and other uh, enterprises simply drop the client. There's too much risk for that client, so we drop them. And what is then the next consequence? The next consequence is you are diabetic. You cannot access insulin. You die. You have HIV AIDS. You do not have access to uh, uh, the antiretroviral drugs. You die. And now with the uh, pandemic of COVID, if you don't get the kind of uh, medicine you need even to be able to diagnose that you have COVID-19, uh, you are at a greater risk of dying. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs uh, and Mark Weisbrot. Jeffrey Sachs is professor in Columbia since the year 2000. He's been the uh, senior advisor of uh, the secretary general first it used to be uh, Kofi Annan, then it was uh, Ban Ki-moon, and now it's Antonio Guterres. In any event, uh, he's been the advisor for the Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, he's a man who has uh, enormous um, experience as a professor, as an economist. He's written a, a dozen brilliant books, and he is being considered, of course, for the Nobel Prize uh, in Economics. In any event, he put out a study together with Mark Weisbrot uh, estimating that the U.S. sanctions against Venezuela in the year 2018 alone, 2018, caused the death of an estimated 40,000. Of course, you don't have a body count. Uh, I mean, this is an estimate which, of course, economists uh, know how to do. It's like when uh, UNICEF back in 1995 estimated that 500,000 children uh, in uh, Iraq uh, had perished as a result of the uh, U.S. Uh, and U.N. sanctions. But they say they're basically U.N. sanctions, but they were <laughs> imposed through the uh, uh, United States. And uh, I remember uh, Secretary of State Mullen uh, Albright uh, defending them and actually on television a question, do you think it was worth it uh, to impose these sanctions on Iran in order to get a regime change? And uh, she made a pause and then she said, yes, I think it was worth it. Uh, 500,000 deaths, by the way, by the time the sanctions got uh, lifted, uh, more than a thousand, uh, a million. Uh, had perished as a direct result of the sanctions. No, when you have a million deaths, or say you have in um, Venezuela now, say the number of people who died in the year 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, I wouldn't be surprised if the number of deaths is well in excess uh, of 100,000. Direct consequence of sanctions and financial blockade 
well, doesn't that add up to a crime against humanity? Crime against humanity, Article 7 of the Statute of Rome. It is in the field of competence of the International Criminal Court to investigate that. And as you may not know, on the 13th of February of this year, the Venezuelan foreign minister, Jorge Arriaza, personally went to The Hague to uh, submit a complaint against all countries imposing sanctions uh, for their responsibility in the deaths uh, of tens of thousands of Venezuelans. And let's see now whether the prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, uh, carries out the investigation. She has shown actually more courage than her predecessor. Her predecessor, the Argentinian Ocampo, uh, well, let me not use epithets. Let's just say that uh, I always doubted his uh, professionalism and his objectivity. But uh, Fatou Bensouda, uh, she uh, tried to get an investigation into crimes in Afghanistan. And lo and behold, because of massive threats and massive pressure from the United States, uh, three judges of the International Criminal Court uh, decided not to conduct an investigation. Fatou Bensouda appealed that decision. She, as prosecutor, said, no, this has to be investigated. He went up to the appeals chamber and the appeals chamber overturned the lower decision so that now an investigation into war crimes and crimes against humanity in Afghanistan is in progress. An investigation, not an indictment. They haven't indicted anybody yet. But uh, the same thing with uh, Venezuela and sanctions. I want to see the investigation get off the ground. I want to see an accounting. I want to see uh, how many died because of malnutrition, how many died because of uh, lack of access to medicine, how many died because of sabotage also, because uh, as you well know, uh, there is uh, organized sabotage paid, of course, by the uh, CIA uh, in, in Venezuela and in other countries uh, in order to destabilize the country so much in the expectation that the people will uh, revolt. Now, I was in Venezuela. I spoke with the people. I walked the streets. I went into the supermarkets. I speak Spanish, of course. It's my mother tongue. So I had no difficulty uh, relating uh, to Venezuelans. And of course, I didn't walk around with a bow tie and uh, with a bodyguard or something. I just wanted to meet people normally without telling them whom I was. Uh, but what I learned uh, is that the masses are not blaming Maduro. They're not blaming uh, the government for the misery that they are suffering. They're blaming the United States, and correctly so, because the United States uh, is the direct cause of the artificial financial and economic crisis uh, that Venezuela is enduring. There's a uh, very uh, impressive lady whom I interviewed twice when I was in uh, Venezuela, uh, Professor Pascualina Curcio. Pascualina Curcio is professor of economics at the University of Caracas. And she published a book, which by the way has been pub uh, also translated into English, uh, a book called La Mano Visible uh, del Mercado, The Visible Hand of the Market. Uh, then she published uh, a very important book on hyperinflation, and she explains how hyperinflation is induced, how it is manipulated, how there has been a deliberate attack on uh, the currency, on the Bolivar. And then she uh, uh, published uh, most recently, this is, just came out, uh, La Economía Venezolana, uh, Cuentos y Verdades, uh, 
just came out, an analysis of the uh, economic situation in um, Venezuela. So um, what does that all add up to? What does it tell you? Uh, it, it tells you that uh, this is a non-conventional war. This is a hybrid war. This is uh, a deliberate attempt at regime change through asphyxiation. The idea is to asphyxiate the economy of the country so that sooner or later they will surrender. It's like the siege of Leningrad uh, in the uh, Second World War. The Nazis uh, tried to bring Leningrad down. So for 872 days, they sieged uh, the town. And uh, the estimates go from 700,000 to a million deaths uh, directly uh, resulting from uh, the siege of the town. So what is the United States doing? The United States is besieging a whole country. It's not attacking the country uh, with the Air Force or with tanks. Uh, or uh, It's attacking them with drones. You remember the drone attack? Uh, on uh, Maduro that uh, miserably failed, but in any event, uh, there was a drone attack uh, and it was uh, organized in the United States. As the case uh, may be, here you have a war situation in which uh, you are besieging a country in the purpose uh, that the government will collapse. The fact is that, as I said, the Venezuelan uh, people, even if the society is very polarized, huh? of course, uh, the opposition, they have their Guaidos and their Capriles and their Ledesmas and their Borges, etc., etc., but they're all puppets of Washington. I think they're not interested in the well-being of the Venezuelan people. They're interested in the well-beings of the 1%, the uh, well-beings of the Venezuelan elites, and they want to go back to the good old days when the rich were rich and the poor were poor. And uh, so the idea of a more equitable distribution of wealth is not uh, what either Guaido or Ledesma or the others uh, are aiming at. They're aiming at, shall we say, the great privatization so that they can buy the uh, natural uh, uh, resources, uh, dismantle government uh, enterprises, get them for little money and then make uh, billions. And of course, American investors and transnational corporations would come in and uh, that would be the great looting, you know, they'd have a tremendous bonanza if they were to come to uh, Venezuela after the collapse uh, of the socialist government of uh, Maduro. So that is what is at uh, stake. And now if I can uh, link it again, uh, with um, uh, COVID and the uh, world humanitarian crisis that we are uh, living through. Well, isn't it a crime against humanity to maintain this uh, sanctions regime and this asphyxiation policy against uh, Venezuela now? that there is uh, this worldwide uh, uh, danger uh, posed by uh, COVID-19. How many more Venezuelans will die because of the sanctions? To what extent has the capacity of Venezuela to combat the uh, COVID-19 been so weakened uh, through the sanctions? that they will not be able to cope with it. I mean, these are questions that I am posing. I'd like to see some answers. And I'd like to see the International Court of uh, Justice take up the matter. Not only the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice could examine the legality or rather the illegality of uh, the sanctions as a violation of the United Nations Charter. What I always say is that uh, the UN Charter is the constitution of the world. The 
principles and purposes of the organization are in Articles 1 and 2 of the Charter, the principles of multilateralism, the principles of solidarity, the principles of uh, cooperation are in Articles 55, 56, etc., etc. Uh, that's what I would like to see the International Court of Justice do. In order to do that, of course, it cannot do it motu proprio. It cannot just simply say, oh, I feel like uh, issuing a statement on sanctions. It's necessary that the General Assembly adopt a resolution and elevate the legal questions to the ICJ. What are the consequences? Because if you have a violation of international law, there's also an obligation to make reparation. So the International Court of Justice uh, could estimate the damage that these uh, sanctions have done on Cuba, on Iran, on Venezuela, on Nicaragua, on Syria, etc., and say the United States has an obligation to make reparation, not only to lift the sanctions, but to make refera- uh, reparation in a certain amount. I would like uh, to see that, but um, don't hold your breath. Uh, the United States uh, is not about to roll over. That is, uh, Trump uh, will uh, continue his bullying, he will continue uh, his um, attitude of being legibus solutus, of being above uh, international law and of uh, having uh, total impunity, whatever uh, he does. Uh, As you know, the United States uh, is not a state party to the Rome Statute, uh, so Uh, You cannot directly uh, indict uh, an American because the United States has not recognized it. But, of course, you could indict uh, allies of the United States who are indeed uh, parties to the International uh, uh, Criminal Court statute. As we know from other United Nations reports, every time that they are so-called safeguards, they don't work. And there's a study with regard to the sanctions imposed on uh, Syria uh, that uh, shows exactly that. Uh, They uh, interviewed uh, medical doctors in Syria and they say, well, yes, there is an exclusion. Uh, In principle, uh, you should be able uh, to import medicines. The fact is that because of the sanctions, the whole thing is uh, so risky for an enterprise that the enterprise that is interested in profit saying the Syrian market doesn't interest me anymore. It's just too complicated. So they drop it. And the consequence is even though there there would be a loophole that would would allow humanitarian aid or medical aid uh, to enter Syria, Uh, It's not being used uh, because uh, enterprises, uh, time is money. The whole procedure of it is so complex uh, that they say, forget it. No, drop Syria, drop Iran, drop uh, Venezuela. We're out of it. And uh, so that is a, a matter that I would like to see understood. And you can help in making these matters uh, understood. Uh, Another recent um, uh, scandal, and we're going to see what happens in May, probably will be postponed because of the uh, COVID-19, Bolivia. I mean, Bolivia, we've had another example of a right-wing coup d'etat. Totally illegal, you know, the destruction of the rule of law and... uh, the complicity of the Organization of American States uh, in uh, the coup d'etat. It's absolutely shocking uh, that the Organization uh, of American States uh, that should be there to protect democracy, to protect the rule of law, would be one of the tools of Washington in bringing down uh, the government of Evo Morales. The government of Evo Morales now has been uh, vindicated in a study 
of uh, the SERP and in a study of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology confirming there was no fraud. The uh, elections in October 2019 were proper and uh, Evo Morales won the elections so he would sh should still be president. But again, uh, since the United States, and this is well known, the United States bribed members of the military uh, in Bolivia. Uh, I mean, the life of Evo Morales uh, was in very high danger. He was threatened. And if the military that should protect him actually is the one that tells him, get out ones that tells me uh, we're not supporting you. Well, uh, he saw the writing on the wall and uh, he left basically because he didn't want to see a bloodbath in his country. He loves his country much too much to accept uh, a bloodbath. And um, then you have this uh, farce of a uh, interim president in Janine Añez. It's, it, it's so laughable. Uh, on the other hand, with the connivance, with the complicity, not only of the United States, but of Canada and of the Europeans, what you would have expected uh, is a complete rejection of the coup d'etat by any democratic uh, country, both in Latin America and in the rest of the world, that they would have said, we will not give any recognition to Janine Añez. What was done against Evo Morales is completely off the wall, completely unacceptable. We won't play the game, etc. But the European Union is playing the game. Canada is playing the game, etc., uh, etc. Et so we have here uh, a major problem of uh, corruption from within. Uh, those countries that should be protecting the rule of law and protecting uh, the, uh, shall we say, the uh, democratic traditions uh, of America are precisely the governments uh, that are betraying it. And the organization that is there to monitor what's going on, the Organization of American States, is actually an active uh, participant uh, in uh, the uh, coup. Now, uh, back uh, 2,000 years ago, the um, uh, Roman uh, author and philosopher um, Juvenalis, in his satires, uh, he posed the question of questions, uh, which is just as relevant today as it was then. Quis custodiet ipsos custodes? Who is going to be watching over the guardians when the guardian, Luis Almagro, is the one who is, uh, shall we say, sympathizing, conniving, uh, um, helping with uh, disinformation and with uh, suspicions, etc., uh, undermining the democratic uh, government of Evo Morales, instead of protecting it. It's, it, it, it's shocking when uh, the Guardian is corrupt, when uh, the Guardian is not acting according to his oath, is not acting in the interests uh, of uh, democracy or in the interests of the people concerned, but is acting in the interests of the neoliberal cabal, its interests uh, of uh, the transnational corporations, and all of them, that the same as in Venezuela, what do they want? They want the big looting. They want the lithium. They want the natural resources of um, Bolivia. If Bolivia were as poor as a church mice, nobody would have any interest in Bolivia. If Venezuela were poor, nobody would be interested in Venezuela. Why this interference in the internal affairs of Venezuela? Because of petrol, because of gold, because of, um, they have coltan that you need on every phone. 
and they have um, uh, so much natural resources. It's a very uh, enormously rich country that would have no economic crisis at all, at all, uh, if it were allowed to buy and sell like anybody else. If the principles of the World Trade Organization, if the principles of uh, free navigation and free trade uh, were uh, respected, uh, Venezuela would be doing a hell of a lot better uh, than most other countries in uh, Latin America. But here you have a concerted effort to bring it down. The same as back in the years 1970, 1973, when Salvador Allende gets elected uh, president of Chile, Nixon calls in uh, Kissinger and tells him, we will not allow an alternative economic system to succeed in Latin America. So we are going to make the Chilean economy scream. And that is what was done for three years. And when it was not enough, then it was necessary to use more muscle. And then they got hold of uh, General Pinochet, who uh, overthrew the government and put an end uh, to the uh, socialist experiment of Salvador Allende and uh, introduced uh, the Chileans to 17 years of dictatorship. Now, this is uh, what happened in Chile what is happening in Bolivia, what the United States wants uh, to happen in Venezuela and in Cuba and in Nicaragua, just to overthrow all of these governments that do not allow the uh, oligarchies to own everything and to have all the wealth. Now, I mentioned Juvenalis and the idea of quis custodiet ipsos custodes. Now, we have another scandal in our hands, huge scandal, Duma, the chemical weapons, the so-called attack uh, by uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, against his own people in Duma. Now, the uh, organization uh, for the prohibition of chemical weapons, which initially uh, was a fairly credible organization has now lost all of its credibility. Uh, there's been one scandal after another uh, with four whistleblowers coming out and saying uh, the report that was issued by the uh, Office uh, of Organization on the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons uh, was not only manipulated, it simply says the opposite of what they themselves uh, had uh, determined. So that uh, imagine if the Guardian being the OPCW uh, disregards what its own investigators have found and produces a uh, manipulated report to put the blame on uh, Bashar al-Assad, that is really uh, breath takingly unethical. It is uh, such a betrayal of trust. And more and more, you ask your questions. Where is that happening also? When we trust that maybe the European Court of Human Rights is going to make a, an objective evaluation of a problem, or uh, the Inter-American uh, Commission and Court of Human Rights are going to make a, an objective juridical uh, examination of an issue. Can we believe them? Do, can we have any trust in what these uh, uh, organizations that originally were created as guardians? In the, originally, they were supposed to be the watchdogs. Uh, so you, you realize how serious the problem is. But going back to the beginning, COVID-19. What should the world community demand? Not the artificial international community that uh, Trump speaks of, because Trump speaks of, when he speaks of the international community, is the United States and our friends. 
That's the international community. Everybody who disagrees with the United States doesn't belong to the international community. But the world community, meaning people, peoples, people power, they should demand that in this situation of a world pandemic, that immediately all sanctions must be lifted. Sanctions are killing people in Iran, they're killing people in Syria, they're killing people uh, in Venezuela and Cuba. These sanctions are crimes against humanity, they must be lifted. And uh, they can be lifted if uh, enough uh, demand by uh, peoples uh, in every country, in the third world, in uh, Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, if that is articulated. But then we come back to another problem that we were discussing earlier, the media. Who owns the media? When the media is the corporate media and the corporations want to continue making money, and the con corporations have an interest in maintaining the status quo, they don't want to change. They don't want uh, to have uh, socialist governments uh, where they will make lesser profits. Uh, so this takeover of the media by the corporations is one of the most anti democratic developments of the last uh, 50 years. I remember when I was a student uh, in Chicago uh, in high school that we used to have like 30 newspapers. And um, whether you read the Chicago Tribune, which had a Republican conservative uh, point of view, or the Chicago sometimes that was m more shall we say, socialistic, democratic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. you had really distinct points of view, and you had a whole spectrum of views in 30 newspapers or so. Uh, when I went back to Chicago in 1993 as professor, I was professor there for a year, 93, 94, uh, professor of law at uh, the DePaul University College of Law. Well, uh, whether you read the Chicago Tribune or the Chicago Sun-Times, it was exactly the same thing. Uh, whether you <laughs> read uh, any newspaper, the Los Angeles Times or the uh, Wall Street Journal, you were still getting uh, the oligarchic point of view and the point of view uh, of uh, CNN, essentially. So uh, the plurality of, uh, of views had disappeared. And uh, my experience as a uh, special rapporteur of the United Nations uh, is that uh, my reports, my press releases, were picked up primarily by the alternative uh, media. Uh, the um, major media uh, tended to um, ignore whatever I uh, stated or wrote, um, most notably in the case of um, my report on Venezuela, since I was not singing the song that they expected me to sing. Uh, but my uh, malaise, my uh, uh, disgust is when uh, I see the way that uh, uh, human rights is manipulated, the way that um, uh, only one side is being attacked, that uh, double standards are being applied, and uh, that is uh, still the case uh, today. Uh, that's uh, is likely to go away, but it is important uh, that people have access to all the uh, information. And that means you, and that means people like you, 
uh, putting out uh, these uh, interviews. Uh, I don't think that uh, this interview is likely to be uh, censored by YouTube. They certainly did not censor the prior interview that you made of me. Uh, I don't think I've said anything that could be considered in any way, shape or form as contrary to uh, the um, uh, democratic principles and the uh, human rights principles uh, that uh, YouTube uh, ostensibly adheres to. We appreciate, I think, the work that you do. The reports are, are valuable that you do, like the one in Venezuela, as well as um, the commentaries you make on your website. I think it's Desias Alfred uh, at word, uh, WordPress.com, as well as your that Twitter. Is, that is the blog. And uh, yes, I would be very happy if people go on the blog and make comments, uh, Desias Alfred dot, uh, uh, WordPress. But I also have a uh, website which uh, encompasses my articles, chapters in books, uh, my literary endeavors, uh, and that is www.alfreddesires, in one word, dot com, not org, com. So www.alfreddesires.com. Uh, there, again, you go on publications and then you will find many uh, of my uh, articles and books, etc. And you will find also reviews, because one thing that uh, dismays me in this uh, world of uh, fake news and disinformation is that uh, some critics uh, pretend uh, that uh, my books uh, were negatively reviewed. Well, the fact is that uh, certainly 90% of the reviews were very positive. Uh, and I've written nine books. And uh, that these books methodologically uh, have been recognized as being rigorous, as being objective. Uh, but obviously, I'm not singing the song that some people want me to sing. So those people who dislike my message, uh, they claim that, uh, well, methodologically is not good, or they um, uh, claim that I have been, uh, uh, like in Germany, the word is widersprochen, uh, or even uh, widerlegt, which means not only contradicted, but also proven wrong. That has never happened. I mean, in 40 years since I started publishing books, no one has come out and said, this is wrong. They have said, uh, we disagree with this conclusion, but they don't say this, uh, this fact is wrong, because I'm very uh, boringly systematic, and uh, my books sometimes are like half text and half footnotes. So I try to demonstrate uh, every statement has a source, and I give you the source and I give you the page. Uh, or if there have been personal interviews, then I say personal interview carried on this and this a day, where, etc. So um, uh, it's very easy uh, to reconstruct my work. I do not extrapolate. I do not um, uh, go into conspiracy theories or anything like that. I just give you the fact and leave it up to you uh, to evaluate them. But as I said, we're living in a very polarized world, in a world uh, of a great deal of uh, intellectual intolerance. People don't want to hear certain things, and they don't want to believe certain things because it makes them uneasy. Uh, they want to believe that their leaders are good. They don't want to uh, accept the fact that we're not always the good guys. And, you know, this myth of uh, the good guys and the bad guys, instead of understanding, very simple. There's always good in the bad, and there's always bad in the good. There's no pristine... There's no uh, knight in shining armor. I mean, our leaders, unfortunately, are humans, or rather, 
they are humans. <laughs> and uh, of course they have their uh, flaws. So even those that I tend to uh, admire, uh, I know that they have flaws. And I, I, I don't uh, ask the impossible. I just uh, like to judge on a case-by-case -case basis the issues and saying on this particular issue I agree with this uh, politician. On this particular issue I agree with another uh, politician. And sometimes I disagree with both, which is my uh, situation as an American citizen. Uh, I did not vote uh, in 2016 because I was very much against Trump and very much against uh, Hillary Clinton. And I suppose I'll be in the same situation in uh, 2020 if it is indeed Joe Biden. Uh, I have uh, very little respect for the current incumbent or for the challenger. I have greater sympathy for Bernie Sanders Although, of course, he's not perfect, and he, I don't agree with everything he says, and I don't agree with uh, some of his uh, uh, socialist views, etc., but I think he is um, more honest uh, than the others. I would be happy uh, with him uh, as uh, President of the United States as I was uh, happiest with Jimmy Carter as President of the United States, and I am very proud uh, to have met him uh, personally, and I uh, cherish uh, my contact uh, with the man and with his right-hand uh, man, uh, man, right-hand uh, uh, assistant, with whom I entertain uh, a lively email exchange. Okay, Dr. Desaias, we'll leave it there, and we hope you stay safe out there in, in Switzerland. It's a good place to be uh, in the time of COVID-19, or may I call it COVID-1984 even. so. <laughs> Indeed. I'll copy you. Thank you.